Easy, I'm Septa and you're tuned into another Ableton Live tutorial. In today's lesson, we're gonna be looking at basses, specifically the deep style, something you might hear on Flex Out or Dispatch, any of those kind of deeper techie vibes. We're also gonna be taking a look at atmospheric type reeses, so the ones that bind your bass line together as opposed to just the main synth design itself. So without further ado, let's get into the lesson. Cool, so here we are inside Ableton Live, and as always, I'll play through the project first. Cool, so making this track, um, the main thing that we're gonna focus on, as I said in the intro, is the bass and these little Reese parts um, that are quite atmospheric. They're pushed in the background, but they also add to the riff um, of your bass line as well. So like that, as you can hear, loads of reverb. And then these other ones at the top here, which are just layered on top of the sub. Cool, so I'll talk you through the process and um, where I started and what all these bits down the bottom are. So it started off as a massive patch, um, which is only really sub. Um, two oscillators, both on smooth square, going to a band pass filter. Um, I did change it from a bad pass to a low pass a couple of times um, to make some of these variations at the bottom. Um, but that's it, there's really nothing going on. There's an LFO on the cutoff just uh, to create some movement. Does have pitch bend, but I'm not using it. Um, unison's on two, and it's on mono rotate and legato triller. But again, I'm not using it, I'm only using it on one note. It was just as I was exploring the sound in the first place for some inspiration. Um, so yeah, really, really basic patch. Uh, then after that, I've got camel fat, which is the classic. Um, all I did was clear the preset and then the bandpass filter isn't even on, so don't know why I did that. Distortion, bit of tube and a bit of mech, but again really not a lot. Um, mix is quite far down because I found if it was too pushed it become distorted in such a way that I couldn't really use it anymore. So if I turn these plugins off, well actually if I turn the group off there. So just the basic patch sounded like this. Turn on the cog off, sorry. So pretty basic, bit of camel fat. So just adding a little bit, kind of 5%. After that, a bit of trash. Um, oh, there was no real specific setting that I was looking for. I just wanted a texture um, that I felt complemented camel fat as well. So when you're making bases like this, using a um, mixture or combination of lots of different distortions of, of it often gives you uh, a better result than just really, really pushing it. It gives you more complex harmonics, um, adding different types of distortion. So with trash as well. So again, quite a minor difference really. Um, and then it's worth saying I'm only using one stage uh, and the only thing in trash I'm using is the distortion as well. After that, Oligarch, which just using the chorus and the phaser. So it really changes the sound in terms of stereo width uh, and movement. It sounds like it goes away 
in the listening field and then comes back and that's nice for making those atmospheric type ones because if you can push it away and bring it back without using reverb then when it comes back it often sounds drier and a bit fuller and then after that when I've really started to push the sound I've split it into uh, an effects chain so I've got one which is the low end which I'm just using a pro cue to isolate everything under 72 Hertz um, and then the camel fat after that I don't I didn't have switched on and a utility at the end just to make it mono so that's my sub layer and then the mid-range layer just the reverse of the pro Q so just cutting out the lows just get rid of some of these plugins camel fat after that with the bypass filter on this time really just focusing the distortion in the low mids uh, same settings it looks like I've got the flanger on but the amounts on zero so you can hear right at the beginning there it is heavily distorted so past that point I don't really want to distort that anymore otherwise it will start breaking up the sound so that's why I've only used it minimally and then after that, little plate, just to give it a bit of space. Um, shortest decay time, about 25% wet, I'd say. And uh, the low cut, I haven't used it because it doesn't really matter because I've already cut all the lows um, before and after that because the uh, plug-in afterwards is a pro cue just to cut the lows again to make sure they're not going to interfere with my sub in any way. So the mid layer, and then together and then what I've done is resampled it loads of times um, with different LFO rates a little bit of automation on there just to create as many variations in the wobble as I can, resampled loads of them and then use those to kind of create a riff afterwards. They all seem pretty, pretty loud. So a high pass one there. And again. So as I always say, you know, try and create as many variations as you can because then when it comes back to writing your track, uh, it's much easier basically to increase your flow and come up with ideas on the fly rather than, you know, trying to dial in all those things all the time as you're going. Uh, and then the drum group isn't really too important but this kind of um, atmospheric and effects group is what ties the whole groove together. So if I play the groove by itself, with the effects group. So now, before there's any lead in there, before there's any bass in there or anything like that, you can already have the sense of anticipation when, what is it, an eight bar loop comes to an end because of those risers, you know that something's coming. So that really helps when writing your bass groove um, because it allows you to feel the flow of the track before you know, you've come up with any bass variations because in the first place, it can be really hard, especially when you're uh, writing a bass line out of little snippets to get a feel for what's going on. So if you write the effects first, um, I find for me, it generally helps. So. To break down the bass, I've got this sub layer 
kind of in the middle. And that is just a snippet out of these with it low pass, not so, not such a harsh low pass this time because I want to retain a bit of the mid range just so uh, it has volume on smaller set of speakers. So if you play it just with that. So there we have the basis of your groove basically, your, your bass and your um, drums working together with the effects um, that are going to generate the feeling and the vibe of the track. So once you've got that, it's in terms of, it's um, basically you embellish that with the mid-range edits. So all the mid-range edits are made um, out of the same bits so at the sub layer so harmonically they're going to match anyway you don't have to worry about key because as you can see on the uh, massive channel it's all just one note anyway it doesn't really matter and then with those all I've done is pull parts out with um, EQ which is you know it's a really steep curve but in terms of sound design it doesn't really matter some people are like oh you shouldn't ever have EQs with boosts above, you know, three or five dB or whatever. But realistically, in sound design, that that doesn't apply. You're designing the sound. Yeah, I wouldn't have an EQ like that on my master because you know you're definitely going to have some some trouble there. But in terms of sound design, do whatever you can to get the sound you want. It doesn't really matter about you know what anybody else says. So again, EQ, and then little plate afterwards, slightly longer delay time, 50-50 um, on the dry and wet and the low pass doesn't really matter because I know there's no low end in there anyway. So I've layered that on top of uh, the sub on beat one of bar five. So we'll listen to that. Turn off that channel. So then another little one just before it, which I've done exactly the same procedure. Little early gark on this one, really pushing the drive. Um, high pass filter as well, just to cut out the sub. And a little bit of chorus for some stereo width. Now the on the other channel, because I've used a reverb, I don't need to worry about stereo because I know that's going to be adding some stereo to the sound anyway. And then again, same uh, horribly Q curve. And that leads into the one on beat one of bar five. Again, exactly the same, you can see it's on the same channel, so the uh, plugins are the same. This is just a different section out of uh, one of those long resampled parts at the bottom. A nice way to find is called slip editing. Uh, if you have a section there, you know, just move around the start and the end point, and it will keep your um, the beginning of the region in the same place. So that's really handy as well. I'm sure that's this is gonna sound awful, but we'll try it. Shorten that a little bit maybe. Oh, I like that one. Well, there. 
Um, that, that middle edit is the same or was the same as the uh, audio and the other parts. But what I've done is just created a high and low pass sweep in the top here and then cut out the first part of the break other than the kick. So it gives the bass space to feel like it's opening up in the edit and then closing back up again when the, when the drums come in. And it's also a really good way of letting the listener know that something's changed or you've reached a new point in the track. So if I was going to finish this, I'd work more on the variation on this side, not changing it too much, but just enough so it keeps it interesting. And then what have we got? 33 bars, you know, do that all again. So you've got a 64 bar um, section, working in uh, 16 bars at a time. And then once you've got that, so it varies over 64 bars uh, and remains interesting, but still, the same in terms of it doesn't sound like you've got a different track by the end of the 64 bars then that's the first half of your track done really you only need two of those like drum bass is very rigid in structure um, because it's dj friendly music 32 bar intro 64 bar drop 32 bar breakdown 64 bar second drop so you know what you really really want to focus on as a producer uh, of drum and bass music is how to create as much variation from something that is really simple or uh, keeping the same fundamentals because once you crack that then you know you can churn up tunes pretty good so um, I guess that's about it for this one it is a relatively short video but it's a simple premise but it will take you a long time to really get your head head round it and get it sounding how you want um, so yeah I'll come and say goodbye Cool, so thanks again for watching. Mid-range basses, reverb basses, whatever you want to call them, they're quite an essential part to that style of drum and bass. If you are having trouble with it and you're not getting quite the harmonic sound that you want at the end, just try changing the parameters within the distortions or di trying different distortions and you might have a different outcome. Because the sounds are quite harmonically rich, just little changes will make a big difference in the end sound. So I'll have another video up next week. Do like and subscribe. Thanks very much for watching.